know what this is giving? Chitara realness. Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Crew Tribe. Crew Tribe. Crew Tribe. Anybody else watch Big Brother? If you are new here, hello. My name is Sarah and what I do here is tell you a terrible story to ruin your day and put on my makeup while I do it. Is that a weird combination? We've already decided we like it. It's fine. It's fine. This is fine. So if you do like it, make sure you subscribe to this channel and hit the bell notification so that you never miss one of my terrible stories. One more thing before we get started. Reminder, there is a uh, new merch in the merch store. There's also some more merch coming soon. It's the Spoopy Edition shirt. This is the Spoopy Edition pumpkin goblin tea. <laughs> Isn't it cute? So Tyler designed this for me. I love it so much. This is on like a regular t-shirt, but this is large, so it's quite large on me. Um, and it's the very soft Bella and Canvas shirts. They're the best. Anyways, all, all this stuff is linked down in the description box, so go check it out. It's almost Halloween, and I haven't done any spooky looks <laughs> this season. I know I'm the worst, but you know, it's, it's kind of hard to like weave in an elaborate costume look when I'm telling a terrible story about the most terrible, awful things that can happen to a person while I'm making myself into a Frankenstein. <laughs> but I simply cannot let the season pass by without doing something. So today's video is less about uh, one particular thing and more so about a very spooky and creepy location. The story today, the Cecil Hotel. So as crew crime creeps, you know who you are. You guys have probably heard a lot about this place and there have been more than a couple of documentaries about it. And the most recent one focused on the mysterious disappearance and death of a woman in 2013. We're gonna get there. But there's a lot of history and weird shit to cover, so. <laughs> Let's get to it. The Cecil Hotel started construction in downtown Los Angeles, California in 1924. Leading this $1 million project was hotelier William Banks Hanner. And $1 million in 1924 was like $20 million in today money. The hotel was intended to be a destination hotel for international businessmen and also for like middle-class tourists. There was some research that indicated that it was intended to be like a super luxurious, high-class, fancy type of place, but that is up for debate. I guess. Well, the reinforced concrete hotel building was designed by Loy Lester Smith in the Beau Arts style. It featured 14 floors, hang on. <laughs> it featured 14 floors, 700 rooms, and a stunning marble lobby, very ornate, stained glass windows, palm trees, opulent staircase, you get it. There was actually quite a boom of fancy hotels going up in LA and the Cecil was one of the first. So the Cecil was very profitable for the first couple years after it opened, but in 1929, America and the rest of the world fell into the Great Depression. This left many people jobless, homeless, hopeless. This would lead to many sensational and tragic events that followed at the hotel and it would change the perspective and the perception of the hotel forever. Okay, so the hotel opened in 1924, but within five years, the world had fallen into economic collapse. So what had begun as a promising, budget-friendly hotel pretty quickly transitioned into a fancy flop house. Nobody had money for vacations but the Cecil still had to pay their bills until the hospitality industry bounced back, so they got creative. So they cut their nightly rates, they offered long-term stay options, and they adopted a hostel style setup where tenants had single rooms but shared bathrooms with other guests. Sounds like a nightmare. By 1927, the rooms with a shared bathroom cost $1.50 per night. <laughs> rooms with a private toilet cost $2 a night, and rooms with a private bath cost $2.50 per night. With so many people out of work, the downtown area near the hotel quickly deteriorated and became overrun with transients and unhoused people. We now know it as... Yeah! 
Well, unemployment only got worse as the years went on, and at the height of the Great Depression in 1933, 25% of the nation's work population was unemployed. I mean, that's almost 13 million people. So the Cecil Hotel was an affordable option for people that were struggling to get by. But it also became a magnet for those who would take advantage of the cheap rates and the built-in clientele. So it became a notorious hotspot for shady business, criminal activity, lots of drugs. So, you know, not a, not a great start for the hotel. Things really only got worse. The first death at the Cecil Hotel came only two years after it opened. In June of 1926, a man named William McKay was found dead in his room from what appeared to be natural causes. I mean, people die in hotel rooms all the time, right? No big deal. Was that the start of something sinister? On January 23rd, 1927, the LA Times reported that a Cecil Hotel guest, 52-year-old Percy Ormond Cook, was down and lonely and down on his luck, separated from his wife and son, and he turned a gun on himself. He was taken to a hospital, but he only survived a few more hours. The amount of suicides that occurred at the Cecil Hotel is like staggering, like this orange eyebrow. It will make sense later. <laughs> After Percy Cook, there were 13 known suicides to occur at the Cecil Hotel. Well, I mean, apparent suicides. Not all of them were truly confirmed or, you know, some have suspicious circumstances. So these suicides that occurred at the Cecil Hotel, some of them had some surprisingly common themes, more surprising than you would think. The first one being poison. So on November 19th, 1931, 46-year-old William C. Norton died in his Cecil hotel room after ingesting poisonous capsules. 39-year-old Navy officer Erwin C. Neblett was also found dead in his room by poisoning in May of 1939. There was no explanation or note. The next instance was self-inflicted physical violence. In September of 1932, a maid discovered the body of 25-year-old Benjamin Dodich having shot himself in the head while in his room. In July of 1934, 53-year-old Army Sergeant Louis D. Borden cut his own throat with a razor blade. Jesus Christ. His several suicide notes indicated that he was in ill health. And then there were the jumpers. Grace E. Magro fell from a ninth floor window in March of 1937. Her fall was actually broken by telephone wires, you know, on the way down. And they were all kind of like tangled around her body. So we're kind of squinting at that one. Like, was she, was she pushed or did she leap? In November of 1947, 35-year-old Robert Smith fell from a seventh floor window. On October 22nd, 1954, 55-year-old Helen Gurney jumped from a seventh floor window, landing on top of the Cecil Hotel's marquee. 50-year-old Julia Frances Moore jumped from her eighth floor room window on February 11th, 1962. On October 12th of 1962, 27-year-old Pauline Otten leapt from a window in her ninth floor room, and then she landed on a person. 65-year-old pedestrian George Giannini killing them both immediately. On December 20th, 1975, a still unidentified 23-year-old woman jumped from a 12th floor window. In 1992, another identified person, this time a man, leapt to his death. And lastly, on June 13th, 2015, Another unidentified person, this one being a 28-year-old man, was found dead outside the hotel, having jumped from it. Hotel windows don't normally open. This is probably why they don't open. Was, was there something in that hotel that was driving people to jump out of it? It all kind of got me thinking about you know, the rate of suicides in hotels. I wondered if it was, you know, just a common location for self-inflicted deaths. You know what I found out? Yeah, it is. Big time. It's like 19 times more likely that somebody will do the deed in a hotel room than, you know, some other location. And it's because the chance of avoiding 
rescue is higher in a hotel because of the privacy, especially when the method is more survivable, like, you know, with drugs or something. It also avoids discovery by a family member, you know, after completion. So then it just makes it some poor hotel maid or staff member. I know, I know. It's awful. Well, this like dark cloud that hung over the Cecil Hotel wasn't just driving people to suicide. There were also multiple murders and mysterious deaths. So Grace Magro's apparent suicide was actually investigated as a possible homicide. Remember, she was the one that, you know, fell on the telephone wires on the way down. Well, her boyfriend, 26-year-old sailor M.W. Madison was asleep in the room at the time of the occurrence and had no explanation for what happened. That's suspicious. The only person that could corroborate his version of events was the hotel manager. How? On June 4th, 1964, the deceased body of Goldie Osgood was discovered in her room by hotel staff. She had been beaten, raped and stabbed and her room had been ransacked. So she was a retired telephone operator. She had no husband or family and she was a resident there at the Cecil Hotel. Well, Goldie was well known in the building and in the area because she used to always feed the birds um, in the nearby Pershing Square pigeons. It's actually very sweet. Found right near her body was an LA Dodgers baseball cap that she always would wear and a paper sack filled with bird seeds. So that kind of means that her attacker might have been waiting in her room to ambush her when she returned. And witnesses told police that they had seen her just moments before her body was found. An arrest was actually made in connection with Goldie's murder. Uh, some guy was found wandering around Pershing Square covered in blood, but apparently he was cleared as a suspect. At any rate, Goldie Pigeon Osgood's murder, still unsolved. The most notorious customer in the early days of the Cecil was a young, beautiful actress named Elizabeth Short, now known as the Black Dahlia. Apparently, one of the last places that Elizabeth was allegedly seen alive was the night before she disappeared at the Cecil Hotel bar. I say allegedly because people argue about it. She was never confirmed to have been a guest there, but some say that she was a frequent visitor at the bar, and some say that she was a sex worker that frequented bars in the area, like hotel bars in the area, hoping to get a gentleman caller that she could stay the night with because she didn't have anywhere to live. Allegedly, Elizabeth's incredibly gruesome murder, still unsolved. You guys, there's so much that has happened at this hotel that if I went into detail for all of these stories, we would be here all week. Let me know if you want me to deep dive into any of these particular stories. The most famous or infamous Cecil Hotel guest were none other than serial killers Richard Ramirez and Jack Unterweger. Richard Ramirez, AKA the Night Stalker, lived quietly in the Cecil Hotel during the height of his Los Angeles murder spree from June 1984 to August 1985. Now, it's not clear whether he killed anyone at the Cecil or if this was just a safe place for him to sleep. But Richard Ramirez lived on the 14th floor and he was seen by other residents discarding his bloody clothes in the hotel dumpster and then sauntering up to his room in his underwears or naked. You guys, the Cecil Hotel in the 80s was like a full on hellscape. If you stayed in there, you had to either be selling drugs or using drugs, or you really wasn't even allowed in there because they would label you as a police. You know, watching people throw TVs out, take a blast and throw a television out on somebody's head. Um, you know, just people all night running from room to room, getting high. I mean, it was an all night thing. In the Netflix documentary, Crime Scene, The Vanishing at the Cecil Hotel, which 10 out of 10 recommend, by the way. One of the former residents spoke of the state of the things there and he said it was lawless. He said, back in the 80s, I would never go further than the sixth floor. That was from resident Kenneth Givens in that documentary. He said that usually the higher floors of the Cecil, people would get killed up there. And once they got a guy in the room, they would rob him, beat him up, and then throw him out the window. <laughs> So if you didn't watch yourself, you might come flying out of there with no wings. Los Angeles historian Kim Cooper said in that documentary that the presence of Richard Ramirez at the Cecil tells you a lot about the kind of place it was. 
Well, the Night Stalker wasn't the only serial killer to take up residence at the Cecil Hotel. Jack Unterweger, an Austrian journalist, stayed at the Cecil while on assignment in America in 1991. A little bit of backstory on our friend Jack. <laughs> he had actually been convicted of murdering a young woman back in 1974 and gone to prison in Austria. But while serving his sentence, he wrote a lot. He gained some notoriety and it was somehow received as like evidence of rehabilitation. But after serving the court mandated 15 year minimum, he was released in 1990. Shocker, he got right back into murdering. He killed another eight sex workers in Europe. He strangled them with their own bras. Can you imagine? Also, that was the exact same way that he killed the other one, the first one. Well, he had come to LA on a writing assignment and guess what he did while he was in town? No surprise, he immediately went on a murder spree, killing three more sex workers. Let me know if you want me to cover that case because it's infuriating. Don't get me started. Don't get me started. Don't even get me started. In the early 2000s, real estate developers purchased and renovated the hotel's lobby and common areas and then sold the property. It was rebranded as Stay on Main and the building was divided into three separate uses. Floors two and three were long-term low-income tenants. Floors four through six was like a budget hostel for young tourists. And then the remaining top floors were the Cecil Hotel. Hell. So the case that you're likely the most familiar with is the 2013 disappearance of the Canadian student Elisa Lamb. Elisa was reported missing on January 31st, 2013. She had been scheduled to check out of the Cecil Hotel and then leave to head up to Santa Cruz, but she never showed up. So the hotel was searched as best as they could. You know, they couldn't really go into every room and space without warrants and all that. They brought in canines. They reviewed all available security footage and she was seen in one of the hotel elevators on January 31st acting, you know, kind of weird. What I mean is like she was making odd gestures, um, pressing every button on the elevator panel, poking her head out like somebody was following her or like she was running from someone. It's, it's all very creepy, actually. So some people say that maybe she was being pursued by someone, you know, chased, or some people say that she was on drugs, or some people say that she was having a psychotic episode. We don't know. Meanwhile, residents and guests at the hotel started complaining about their water having a strange color or smell. And the water was quite discolored. It was, it was like a, uh, a dark, color like a, it had like a brown tint to it so a maintenance worker went up to the roof to examine the hotel's water tanks <laughs> he found elisa's nude bloated decomposed body floating inside of it we were brushing our teeth using that water we were showering in that water uh, we did um, drink the water. I mean like floating inside this water tank that supplied water to guests rooms kitchen coffee shop. Well, Lisa's death was ruled an accidental drowning with bipolar disorder as a significant factor. Elisa had suffered from mental illness for many years and there were no other signs of foul play. Right, but then why would she go up to a locked rooftop area and then climb inside a relatively small water tower? I mean, who knows? So the Cecil Hotel, as you may have guessed, was one of the inspirations for season five of American Horror Story, you know, starring the Lady Gaga. What brings you to the Cortez? I mean, most obviously the Hotel Cortez was like Art Deco style and it featured the Black Dahlia and Richard Ramirez as guests. Property was sold again in 2014 to a development company from New York City. There were plans to totally gut the hotel and turn it into like an upscale boutique condo combo situation, but it seems like that plan fell through. In 2017, the property was declared a historic cultural landmark by the Los Angeles City Council, and it became part of the Skid Row Housing Trust, converting it into subsidized housing. Sadly, the LA Times ran a story just a few months ago that the building seems to be in the same lawless condition, dump, 
that it always was. Mold in the rooms, non-functioning elevators, trash in the hallways, and mice and roaches scurrying around every corner. Ugh. Some people say that there's a curse on the Cecil Hotel and that it's severely haunted with it being featured on the Discovery Plus show, Ghost Adventures. Should I just color in that bottom lip? Does this look ridiculous? Content creator Pete Monzingo on YouTube and TikTok has made some videos that feature eerie and unexplainable activity at the Cecil Hotel. Things like lights turning on, curtains moving, doors opening and closing, and nobody's there. He's even captured what appears to be apparitions. In the hotel, there was an old man smoking a cigarette staring at me. So I decided to run to the other side of my apartment to see if his head were to follow me, and it did. So he was looking at me. Hotel Cecil hasn't even been open for years. It's like practically boarded up right now. He even managed to gain access to the inside of the building to film. And he claims that the vibes inside are just, you know, bad and they get worse as you go up. Former hotel manager Amy Price claims that the hotel has seen more than 80 deaths. That includes suicides, homicides, overdose, unknown. I never got used to that. Never got used to that. With that many deaths in one place, it can't be a coincidence. Maybe it really is just a place of darkness and evil. And that is the story of the Cecil Hotel. Okay, so I know this one was a little wild, but you know, it's spoopy season and I wanted to get a little spoopy just for you. This lip is supposed to be, I don't know, fun. I don't know if it is. I think I look crazy. Do I look crazy? Don't forget to pick up your very own spoopy season edition shirt. You can get this in a zip up hoodie. It's all linked down below in the merch shop. Thank you so much for hanging out today and for watching this video. I really appreciate it. If you want to see more videos like this one, then consider subscribing to this channel before you leave today. I upload new videos here on YouTube every week and you can follow me everywhere on all the socials. That is it for now. I will catch you next time in the next video. Bye! Mm, I keep messing up. Did not go the way I planned. I don't know what I'm doing. I am out of my mind. Nothing like painting the inside of your nostrils, am I right? Weird. Do I look insane? Yeah. This is gonna be real fun to remove later. <laughs> How's this looking? Familiar. <laughs> eh. No, that looks so bad. <laughs> Appearance of. <laughs> you guys, I've been reading the Britney Spears book and it's infuriating. Is that a crew crime?